So yes, I'm going to be talking about the, some of the remote administration considerations uh, as, you know, now we're, we're in COVID and uh, even beyond as as Stu had talked about, uh, how we can learn from this experience that we were pushed into and, and make clinical trials even more uh, friendly and accessible for patients and their families. So just to quickly touch on the learning objectives over the next about 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about principles that guide effective remote administrations of outcome measures, important considerations for your team to help you navigate remote assessment administrations, how they can be adapted, both conventional measures and how we can use telemedicine and different computerized technologies to collect data in clinical trials remotely. And I'll talk about some examples of current ways in industry sponsored trials that uh, sponsors are doing this to support um, the, the clinical trials and during COVID now, and even plans further on to make again these visits uh, more accessible and less burdensome to the patients. Okay, so there are many um, benefits to remote administration. I don't think, you know, a year ago we were talking about it, it's in certainly not to the degree that we are now, but now that we are sort of pushed into this experience, I think we're starting to learn that there are actually benefits to running clinical trials with some degree of remote administration and some remote visits. So the benefits are, of course, when subjects cannot attend because the clinic shut down or the, the center shut down because of COVID, uh, or there's situations where your clinic is open, but you have to minimize the time that anyone is in your clinic. So remote assessments can be of great benefit in those situations. But currently, and, and then even moving ahead, there's going to be times when subjects prefer not to attend in-person visits. And in having some degree of your trial remotely, it will increase your enrollment and your retention. And again, like I've talked about, reduce the burden. I think this is particularly relevant when you have very, very impaired participants. It's, I mean, it's also the, the flip side, it, it could be relevant when you have your high functioning participants who are at school or at work and just having you know, increased visits um, does add burden to your, to your trial. So overall, I'm going to talk about some FDA guidance related to this in COVID and then moving beyond COVID. So overall, the FDA's guidance is encouraging the use of modern technologies, including remote administration, both to speed development of, of drugs and, and treatments and increase subject diversity. The specific COVID guidance is to prioritize subject safety encourage new processes. So, you know, engage with the FDA, engage with your IRBs as early as possible in regards to COVID, uh, document how your restrictions have changed, how you're collecting data or any changes in your protocol. They advise that you keep the alternate processes as consistent as possible, which makes sense. And that you just capture any missing data in your case report uh, files. There will be missing data right now in clinical trials. There will be missing data if the trial was designed pre-COVID. I, I don't think that's avoidable probably for any trial. So I just wanted to draw your attention to this guidance if you haven't seen it already. The FDA put this out in May or March and then it edited it in May about the guidance on running your trials during this uh, global pandemic. And it's a very, very helpful guidance document. And I strongly recommend you read it. I put forth a couple of key points from it in the next slides. They absolutely acknowledge the difficulties in avoiding protocol violations. I think this is important to note. Uh, in trying to keep trials going despite COVID and, and trying as much as possible not to have them shut down. And the importance of safety. Even if safety changes are needed to avoid exposure to COVID, potential exposure to COVID, that would fall under safety as being the number one priority. So any modifications needed to avoid exposure to COVID, they would fall under a priority one. Uh, the regulators also 
strongly suggest they put out there, you know, flexibility, which is not always what we're, we see. Um, but I think everyone's in appreciation that the situation needs quick adaptations. So, and they're encouraging even trial design to be flexible and the method of data collection to be flexible. If you're changing an efficacy assessment, particularly like a primary endpoint, definitely consult with the regulators first before doing that. Anything related to safety though, or method of administration, which would fall under safety, importantly, so taking it from in-person to telemedicine, make the change, then talk with the FDA and your IRB. So this is just some text taken directly from that guidance document just to illustrate the kinds of information that's conveyed and, and really truly how pragmatic and helpful it can be. They're saying that you should perform the assessments in a manner as similar as possible at, that you can, but consider if you can collect these certain outcome measures or not, because there's some you're going to be able to collect and there are some that just that you can't. Okay, so now sort of, you know, considering COVID, but also moving past, like there is, I, I'm holding on myself that there is going to be a world beyond COVID. We're, we're going to see that, you know, is it six months? Uh, you know, that's sort of what we're banking on right now, but nobody can really predict. But at some point we will have moved past this. And we will likely still, we'll take what we learned from this period of time and make our trials even better. And how we can do that is thinking about what we can do remotely and keep our data quality, keep our integrity, and what should we think about um, when thinking if we should move a visit or a collection of a certain kind of data to remote. Um, one is the feasibility. Can this assessment be done feasibly in over the, the context of a remote visit? Uh, are there manipulatives? Do we have to hold, does the subject have to hold something or do something in person? That would make the remote uh, tricky. It's not impossible, but it makes it tricky. So that's something to think about. Another piece to think about, now even switching to like a caregiver reported outcome or a patient reported outcome. So essentially a questionnaire. You wanna think about how long it is. So often trials will have a tremendous number of uh, questionnaires that uh, the, either the patient or the family needs to complete. And when you're in the clinic, if you have 30, 40, 50 plus minutes of outcome measures to complete, you know, you're in this dynamic setting, you're supported by the study staff. It doesn't feel particularly burdensome, we hope. But when you're taking that level of completion of these paper-based questionnaires and doing them remotely, you just want to think about length, both from an additional burden standpoint, but also from what your data quality is going to look like if you're having you know, a mother of a child with autism sit down for an hour to do all of these questionnaires. Like by the time that person gets to the end, what's your data quality gonna look like? So it's just something to think about. Um, equivalency, this is a big one. So if the assessment's done um, in person versus remotely, is it the same? So we want to say that it is, I think at face value, I would say that they are. That being said, I don't, for most outcome measures, we don't know yet. There are very few equivalency studies that have been done comparing you know, in-person and remote. Um, the ones that have been done have been shown that it's equivalent, but I think it's a really important question to think about. And if you need to shift to a remote visits immediately, it's a risk. It's a risk for your trial. I haven't seen, personally in the sponsors I interact with, I haven't seen anyone not take that risk, but you, you do just need to be aware that it's a risk. Um, the other piece to think about is permission. So when you're working in academia, as long as the licensed provider, the qualified provider purchases a scale, you can purchase them and use them. 
the process is different in industry. You have to license this scale. You have to document your permissions from the copyright holder. So often these contracts have detail in them about method of administration or how you're going to use that scale. So if you're planning a trial or shifting your trial to remote assessments, you wanna ensure that you have the correct permissions in your contracts. Um, I have not found a copyright holder that's denying that permission, but you definitely wanna document it. You also of course want the change in approach approved by your IRB. Then in terms of how you manage this in a sort of pragmatic way, you, know, you think about until you're faced with this challenge of designing remote visits or quickly shifting to remote visits, it seems pretty straightforward, but then you have, you know, a phase three trial that's across, across the globe and in, you know, all these different languages and different countries and how you get them, the materials and how you get, how you're going to have the caregivers complete scales in the, this context. You just need to think about uh, the method. So you have, I would strongly recommend that the, you, connect with the caregivers or the patients by phone or video conference because then you can document and you're assured who is completing the scales that you have the right person filling them out and they're filling them out within the visit window. This is in contrast to mailing it to them and getting it back. I also think if you're relying on the subject and the family to send it back, there's a risk that you won't get your data back. So, but if you connect with them over the phone or over a video conference, you can assure that you have the right person, you're getting your data and you're getting your data when you need it. That being said though, in, as I alluded to in the beginning, as you talked about, some of these are very long and doing what would typically be a written questionnaire or written form just auditorily, like just by hearing it, um, that could become, you know, the, the you have to hold the caregiver's attention. You have to make sure they understand. That can be really complicated. So often, what we're seeing is that we're sending. So sponsors are having um, sites send the form to the caregiver. They're not filling it out independently, but they're they have it so they can see it. They can read the questions as you're going through with it with them over the phone. And then you want to capture all of this in your EDC method of administration. You know, was it phone? Was it video? Was it by mail? You know, everything in your EDC so that you can do the sensitivity analysis if you need to at the end or if you seek to. And it'll also lead to greater um, data related to equivalency. So then that was speaking about our, you know, our patient reported outcomes of behavior and our caregiver reported outcomes of behavior. Now thinking about our direct assessments. So our direct assessments are ones that you do directly with the patient. They do often require manipulatives or writing or drawing. Um, often, particularly with our young children, there is a tremendous amount of organization and setup of materials that's needed. Sometimes there's a potential risk. Um, the subject might put something in their mouth or um, sometimes with motor tasks, we just have to just have you know, an eye on them to be careful. And there's just greater complexity of the instructions. The demands are greater and what you're explaining the patient to do is more complex with these direct assessments. I'm not saying that they can't be done remotely. They can't be done via telemedicine in all cases and in all contexts. That's, that's not true, but they do have significant complexities. You also need to think about kind of the cognitive abilities of your population, as well as the age. So do you have kids? Do you have adults? Do they have an intellectual impairment? Do they not? All of those factors you just want to consider when you're planning what's going to be in person and what's going to be remote. So to support this at-home administration and telemedicine approach for direct assessments, from what I've seen thus far during the pandemic, this is a very tricky one to pivot and change and adjust for. Often these direct assessments are what's missed in clinical trials right now. But given this fact that this is the most complex one to sort of navigate, I'm seeing a lot of uh, sponsors uh, trying to problem solve in advance. So if you want to 
increase the amount of remote administrations, remote visits moving forward? What can we do, even if it's not an instant pivot, if it's a plan, more of a planful approach? Uh, there, there's lots and lots of trials that are being planned right now, thinking about how this can be implemented into the future. And some are actually implementing it now. It just was not a quick shift. Um, and here are just some examples, you know, having visiting nurses, that's when having trained staff go to the home, um, doing things with, with wearables, with devices, uh, using the telephone and video call, like I talked about, uh, sending devices uh, to, to the subject's home. And now also with the, the web-based, you can see there at the bottom, I'm seeing more and more trials uh, now collecting on or and or planning to collect data via web-based platforms, both behavioral data, but also interestingly, cognitive data. So attention, speed of processing, memory, things as a neuropsychologist, I typically think about as needing to be one-on-one -on -one in person in my testing room, like no distractions, et cetera, like really tight, tightly controlled. And then particularly within a clinical trial, really tightly controlled. But uh, sponsors in, in autism and foundations working in autism are thinking about ways to use these web-based platforms to collect this behavioral and importantly cognitive data. And you're, uh, that's gonna be, coming up soon. I think it will be um, deployed and implemented very soon. And it's, uh, it's really interesting. So overall, if you know, and, and I talk with a lot of sponsors running clinical trials and at, when asked about this, you know, remote assessments and, and what we can do, you know, broadly, both within COVID and more broadly. So things like PRO skills, so the patient reported outcomes or caregiver reported outcomes, Generally speaking, remote administration is possible. Clinical interviews like the Vineland, remote administration is possible. The direct assessments, it, you know, your devices, your wearables, your computer, um, web-based platforms, definitely possible. I think doing, if it's a trained clinician, home-based can work. That's, that is really, really tricky. And it's not something that I would necessarily recommend without a lot of support and planning. But the other kind of devices, the I think they're up and coming in, in their use in clinical trials. So I think those kinds of things are possible, but some of the more traditional neuropsychological assessments um, are, are, are more tricky. Um, one I'm often asked about is the CGI. So can you do a CGI remotely? And for this one, my thought process is often, you must consider the trial specifics and the indication. So if you're asking about behavior, but do you need to see the patient and take your own measurement of their behavior? Or is it an indication where it's, their individuals are very, very impaired? Where you're not really gonna talk to, that, to the individual, you might observe them briefly, but really the CGI is designed as a caregiver report. Um, and, and cite staff report to use that for your judgment. Those kind of measures I think can be done um, remotely. But if interviewing someone with autism and, and talking with them, and that's where you're gaining your information, I think that can be tricky and you just need to think carefully about that um, when using you know, for a CGI. Then here's a, a, a case example. This was a phase three trial in a pediatric indication, developmental disability, and they're in the midst of their phase three trial and you know, COVID hit and they did not wanna pause. So they needed to adapt uh, very quickly to the, the changing, changing world of COVID. And they had multiple caregiver reported outcomes. Those were all then completed by phone. They had a Vineland as one of their key outcome measures that was then completed by video conference. Importantly, this is a, a scale that's commonly used in autism and the copyright holder of the Vineland, so it's Pearson, strongly suggests that it be, it can be completed remotely, but that you do it over video as opposed to just over phone. So the sponsor took that advice and they were administered by video conference and they did a CGI and they also administered that over a video conference as well. So they were able to keep their trial going in entirety, completely remotely. 
So it's just a positive case example of one. I know a lot of trials have struggled a lot. So I just wanted to share one that actually um, is going quite well. So moving ahead again, you know, when you're thinking about remote assessments beyond COVID and, and you have the flexibility to say, we're gonna do remote or not, we're planning our future trial, what is it gonna look like? You wanna establish, you know, what kind of supports does your population need? Are they very young children? Um, you know, what's the level of intellectual functioning? Then what outcome measures are of interest to you from a conceptual standpoint? What types of behavior or cognition are you attempting to, are, are interested in measuring? And then how can we measure those concepts? Do they, what kind of tests are available to us? And are those tests or questionnaires, are they a, ones that can be adapted to a remote visit or ones that were definitely require in person. So this is the thought process. And I think then we're going to you know, end up with a future that has a lot of hybrid trials. So that's our, our new normal. So there's lots of pros on remote testing. There's much less burden on study participants. You can get more data uh, that would reduce total variability. You have almost instantaneous movement of the data you collect to your EDC or your database. There's not a backlog of data entry. There's a potential for more extensive testing like with wearables or devices that you use that can lead to a more constant and richer description of the patient. Uh, the QC process can be done you know, almost in real time, like particularly if you're using a web-based platform or something of the like, uh, if the patient or carrier is inputting something, they can see an error message right away if there's the mistake is made. And the cost can be reduced with this. If you look at it from a big picture standpoint, the development will, will have a cost, but in the end, it's gonna be more cost-effective to have some of these um, data collected remotely. There are some cons. I mean, some patients even, you know, it may feel like a surprise sometimes when you're working with some of them, but you know, many, they, they like to come to the clinic. They like to see their doctors, um, the families particularly. I think they find many of the visits and seeing the staff, like it's a very supportive experience. It depends on many visits, you know, it can become burdensome, but oftentimes these, the families look forward to their visits. Um, the data you collect, definitely, like I cannot stress this enough, it is not under the same, the, the conditions can't be controlled. So it's definitely, there's more variance that's gonna be introduced at home or in a remote setting than in the clinic. And you'll have to, partly because of that, and partly, particularly if it's less supervised, there's gonna be a tremendous like QC need, particularly early on. Um, and then there's gonna be certain tests and elements of, of data collection you're not gonna be able to do remotely. So I, I do think that we are going to see this new hybrid, this new kind of equilibrium in clinical trials, that there's gonna be a balance. I think going from what has become a pretty virtual world over the past nine months, and then if we have our trials, have a demand for all visits, all in person, all the time, I think we're gonna see families say, why can't I do this at home? And I think that's a fair question and one that we're going to have to think carefully about as we're designing trials um, and what can be done at home. Um, I think some home-based assessments can be used more frequently, probably not your primary to start at least, because of this increased variance. I, I don't think we understand it well enough yet. I don't think we understand the equivalency yet um, enough. I would be very cautious of having uh, a primary outcome. Uh, be a, one that's done remotely right now. We'll have to develop some new QC processes, particularly as wearables and devices and all of those kind of technologies become used more and more in trials. The, the QC, I think we're going to um, have to think more carefully about that. I, I also, though, on the flip side of that, see that relatively minor changes, such as the Vineland being done over video conference versus sitting in you know, my office with a patient, I think that is gonna be fine and that's gonna last and that's gonna be something where we're gonna see that as something that we learned through this period of um, COVID-19 that we can take with us into the future and make our trials you know, even more patient and family friendly. All right.
That is the end of, of my slides. I'm very happy to um, take questions now. Well, thank you very much, Pam. That was a great overview and, and some very thought provoking uh, comments there. There are a few questions. Um, we have a few minutes here to, to go through some questions. And one, um, I'll just sort of read them here if you don't mind. Um, regarding the equivalency of assessments, is the risk lower for patient reported versus clinician reported assessment tools? That's a good question. And I, I, I wanna say yes, but we don't have the data to support that. I think at face value, yes. But the contrast of that is, you know, versus if say you have the patient doing just, you know, for an example, like the ABC or it's a caregiver, do the ABC, you know, at home and sometimes or at clinic sometimes, are they more willing to report symptoms if they're filling it out on paper alone versus telling someone? Or do they have the rapport going better mm -hmm. um, with their clinician? So then are they more willing to tell you more versus report on the paper? I don't know. And those are the kinds of things I think we're gonna have to kind of figure out. Okay, fair, thank you for, for that. Um, another question we have is, um, are we able to administer some of the cognitive tests online live with older patients who can independently work online? It's possible. Yes, some are, some are possible. Um, it depends what, what test you're thinking about. I'd have to know more, more but it, as a general rule, yes, some tests can definitely be um, completed. On, it, it, what the term is unsupervised. Mm -hmm. um, unsupervised online, some can be supervised online. Okay, great. And I have one, uh, one more question, uh, or it's more of asking you for a comment. So um, the, the preamble is one benefit with modern software solutions is that you can use automated reminders like SMS and voice messages. Can you please comment on the utility of those, um, good, bad, uh, when they're appropriate, maybe just maybe comment a little bit. Sure. I think they're fantastic and I would use all that you have at your disposal. Um, it depends, <laughs> it's like your, um, you know, the size of your child, the nature of your child. I think right now the ones I'm working on are, you know, in autism relatively to other, you know, giant trials, they're relatively smaller. So instead of using the automated systems, it's the site staff calling everybody to remind them to do what they need to do, whether it's, you know, a sleep diary, a seizure diary, you know, their, their forms, you know, logging something, regardless of what it is. Um, if you have a very, very large trial that becomes impractical and we do have these other technologies we can lean on or, or use a combination of the two. Um, even in small trials, they could use a combination of the two. 